All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I apologize for the delay there. We had a technology glitch, and I'm not as uh, quick on my feet as I usually am. So thank you for your patience. And all of you students uh, couldn't be behaving any, any better. So thank you very much for your patience. <clears throat> uh, I want to just uh, thank, of course, everyone who uh, is responsible for putting this evening together. And that includes the Chatham Education Foundation, who, uh, through their generosity, sponsors events like these. And then, of course, all of the teachers and the Library and Media Center specialists and our supervisors and our parents and um, everyone out there who um, supports nights like these and the great work uh, that's being done in this school district. So to explain a little bit about uh, this evening, two years ago, I wrote a grant to the Chatham Education Foundation uh, that I called the Future Focused uh, Education Series. And what I was hoping to kind of do was imitate what happens in TED Talks. And for those of you students who maybe don't watch TED Talks as often as I do, um, they feature speakers who have something special and something unique to share uh, with an audience and usually kind of gets the audience thinking. And so I, I wrote this grant. The foundation was, was good enough to sponsor it. And here now, two years later, we're in our second year. And uh, this evening, we kick off what I've kind of called the Future Focused Education Celebration. And the hope is that the speakers who will visit with us tonight, one week from tonight when Eric Legrand is here, and then one week from tomorrow night uh, when someone else will join us, is that they offer us a different perspective, um, something unique to think about, and something special that we might be able to take away uh, on a night where we might just be doing something else uh, not quite as rewarding. So, as you all know, our first guest this year is Ms. R.J. Palacio. I don't know if I'm supposed to use her actual name, but we all know her as R.J. Palacio. Uh, and just to give you a, a tiny little bit of background, she spent a career in art direction and graphic design, at least according to Wikipedia, uh, before deciding to write her very first novel, which was Wonder. And as you all know, of course, Wonder is a masterpiece. Um, if you didn't cry when you read Wonder, uh, I don't know how you can be walking around because I cried my eyes out and then I cried some more when I read the Julian chapter uh, and wonder uh, also is a number one New York Times bestseller a 2015 Mark Twain Award 2014 Maine Student Book Award one of Amazon's best books for kids uh, for the year 2012 Texas Blue Bonnet Award best kids book of the year award for or best kids book of the year award for Slate magazine 2012 and I could go on and on and on but I'm sure you're tired of hearing me speak, so let me call up to the stage Ms. Palacio. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's really my pleasure to be here, and, um, and thank you for inviting me to participate and to speak with you guys. I, I, I can't guarantee I'll be as interesting as anybody who's ever been on the TED Talks, but I will, I'll give it a shot. I don't know. Um, what I thought I would do is talk a little about, um, I don't know, this crazy journey I've been on. You know, I, I published Wonder three years ago, and uh, my life has literally changed um, from that point to this point in wonderful ways and, and ways that I thought I would share with you. But I thought I'd kind of maybe tell you a little bit about how I came to write Wonder and my life before Wonder and what led me to write Wonder and then um, things that have happened since. So. Um, yeah, so this is this is Wonder, you guys. I, I, I should have asked, but I can't see the audience now. But I'm assuming most of you in the audience, just by a show of hands, how many people have read Wonder? Just so I know, and I want to make sure, okay. How about clapping hands, because so, I can't see a thing. All right, all right. Um, so I, I thought, actually, to Michael's point, I, w I thought I would, um, I would point out that act my name is actually not R.J. Palacio. I mean, it, it's not my, it is my name, but um, I was born, I, my name that people know me by is Raquel Jaramillo. Um, that's the name on my birth certificate. Um, and uh, R.J. Palacio is my pen name, and I will tell you how I came to that pen name in a little bit, but um, I thought I would talk about uh, how and when I started wanting to write. Basically, from the time I was in middle school, uh, I there were the things that I loved to do the most were I, I like to read, I like to write, and I like to draw. 
And um, I filled my time reading kids' books. These were some of the kids' books that meant the most to me. I, I mean, I was a voracious reader. And um, as I grew up, I kept reading into my teenage years. And, and then there came a point where I thought, okay, well, what am I going to do with my life? And I wanted to figure out a way to do something that combined reading and writing and drawing, but I wasn't quite sure what that would be. I, I think I had kind of vague notions maybe about, you know, like Maurice Sendak or Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, you know, who wrote The Little Prince, doing maybe growing up to like write and illustrate books. Um, but I, I wasn't exactly sure how I would accomplish that. So I decided to go to art school to pursue art, to focus on art, and, and leave the writing um, as something that I wouldn't try to make a living from, something I would do on my own time. Um, and my idea was that I would focus on art and, and try to become a graphic designer or a commercial artist and make a living from that. So I went to Parsons School of Design. I majored in illustration. Um, and then I, I graduated with a portfolio, which, which is what you do, and, and um, I was very lucky. I started getting work pretty much right after I graduated, and ironically, one of my favorite books as a teenager was a book called Dune. One of my first projects as an illustrator was to illustrate uh, the notebooks of Dune, which was kind of fun. Um, and then I started getting illustration work for book covers. Now, book covers is exactly what I wanted to focus on, because I thought, it was a great way of marrying those three things that I talked about earlier, loving. You know, I, I thought if I did book covers, then I could, you know, I'd have to read the book and, and I'd have to kind of figure out how to express it with an illustration. And so I started um, really focusing um, all my efforts on getting work doing book covers. And I took my portfolio around to all the major book publishers in New York. And, um, and then a funny thing happened. Shortly after uh, I graduated and started getting work, I realized that I didn't want to do what I thought I wanted to do. I, I didn't want to be a freelance illustrator. I wanted to actually be one of those people in the offices giving out the work. Uh, I wanted to work in book publishing. Uh, at that point, I had met all of, as a, as a freelance illustrator looking for work, I had met all the major uh, art directors in New York City at the different publishing houses. And I really liked that uh, job. I thought, that is so cool. The idea of like getting paid <laughs> to read and decide what to do on book covers, that, that had great appeal for me. So I got a job as an assistant in a book publishing house. And I started doing, um, doing illustration work. But then I also started doing graphic design and learning a lot about fonts and, and photography, too. And I put together the entire package for books. And that's what I ended up devoting my career to. I, I became an art director. Uh, my job was basically to work with some of the greatest authors of our time, uh, Paul Auster and, and uh, you know, Salman Rushdie. Whoops, sorry. Um, Thomas Pynchon, you know, these are, these are writers that if you're in the fifth or sixth or seventh grade might not mean that much to you, but for adults, they might kind of recognize these names. These are really great authors of our time. And it was wonderful for me because I also, um, you know, the, the way you really hone your craft as a writer is to read as much as possible. So I was reading all the time as part of my job um, and interacting with authors and editors and really getting to know the book publishing industry. In the meanwhile, you know, I started, I, I got married, I started my family, and these are my two sons, Caleb and Joseph. Now, this picture is, uh, oh boy, this is at least seven years old, I think, because my older son just finished his first year in college, so that's how old this picture is. Um, but this was the age they were when I started Wonder, so that's why I put this there. Uh, when I had my children, I, um, I started remembering that very first uh, thing that I wanted to do. Remember, I, I wanted to sort of be like a children's book illustrator. So I started um, photo illustrating my own children's books, which I published under my name, Raquel Jaramillo. And I did a lot of photography and Photoshop illustration. And basically, these were books that I illustrated or took photos for. And, um, and this I did in addition to my job as an art director. This I would do on my own time. And um, it was great because it led to a sort of slight career path divergence. Um, I became the children's book director at a different company. Um, and there, my job was to basically think up good ideas for kids' books. 
Uh, so I don't know if you guys, I mean, you guys probably know BrainQuest, right? Yeah, so I worked on all of those workbooks, and uh, I, I, so my, basically my, my job was to edit other people's work and to hire illustrators and to put books together that I thought would be good for kids. And so it was a great job. I loved it. Uh, I worked really hard there. And while I was there, um, I, I still hadn't gotten a chance to, to really explore that part of me that I'd wanted to explore, to be the writer. And, and I was fine with that. You know, it, it's hard to sort of find the time when you have a full-time job and kids to write a book, you know. So I started thinking, okay, maybe this is something I do when I retire. I don't know, but someday I'll write a book. Um, but then uh, one day, uh, about now it'll be about seven years ago, I was with my kids who were the ages you saw in that picture. My younger son was about three and my older son was about 10, 11 maybe. Um, and... Uh, it was a hot summer day, and we were in the mood for some ice cream. So we went to our neighborhood, Carvel. And I gave my older son some money to go inside and get us some chocolate milkshakes. And my younger son, my younger son was still in the stroller, and I waited in front of the Carvel on a bench uh, for my older son to come back out. And uh, so I had my, my younger son in the stroller facing me, and he had like a board book he was looking at or something. He was kind of distracted. And at a certain point, I realized, um, I kind of glanced over, and I realized that sitting directly next to me was a little girl, and, you know, I think maybe she was about six or seven years old, who had a very severe craniofacial difference. Um, she looks, looked very much the way I described Augie as looking in the book. And she was just, you know, minding her own business, like licking her ice cream cone, talking to either her friend or a sister, I'm not really sure, and her mother. And I panicked. I hate to say it, but I kind of panicked because I knew that the moment my three-year-old looked up and saw her, that he was going to react in a very, very obvious way, that he, he was going to say something or do something or, or maybe even start to cry. Um, when he saw her because I, I knew him pretty well and he was always um, the kind of little kid that's, you know, some little kids are very um, sensitive to those kinds of things. And anyway, and I also wasn't even sure how my older son, who was old enough to know better, would respond just because, you know, I have to admit her face was a little bit shocking. And so I thought at the time that the best thing I could do was to very quietly and without drawing any attention to us, just kind of get up and turn the stroller around, walk to the other side of the sidewalk, and meet my son there. And that's what I started to do. I started to get up, and, uh, and unfortunately, uh, before I could do that, um, everything I kind of thought would happen, happened. My, my older son came out of the ice cream store, you know, carrying the, uh, the three chocolate milkshakes in his arms. My younger son looked up, all excited, and I saw the moment that he glanced over and looked at the little girl. I, 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 I saw the exact moment because his eyes got really wide and his jaw literally dropped open. And I could tell he was about to scream. So before he could do that, I kind of just got up really fast and I you know, spun the stroller around and I started pushing it. And um, at the same time, I, I kind of grabbed my older son and was like, come on, Caleb, let's go very quickly. And he wasn't expecting that. So anyway, I ended up, he, he ended up like dropping all three chocolate milkshakes on the sidewalk. By now, my younger son is crying hysterically, trying to turn around and get another look at the little girl. And I'm just, and my older son, by the way, is like yelling at me because he has no idea why I'm acting like such a lunatic. And he was like, mom, what are you, what are you doing? You know, really loud. So here I was trying to like walk away really without getting noticed. And it was the exact opposite. My younger son is screaming. My older son is screaming. And I'm just trying to like get away as quickly as possible. And as we were uh, leaving, I, I heard the mom of this little girl say in a voice that I will never, ever ever forget, um, she said very calmly and very sweetly, she said, okay, girls, I think it's time to go. And at that moment, as a mom, I have to say, my, um, my heart kind of broke for her because I thought, oh, my goodness, she must go through this a million times a day. But here's the thing. Even as I was pushing the stroller away, there was a little voice inside my head that knew that I had kind of messed things up. 
I didn't know exactly what I should have done, but I knew that the way I had just handled the situation was not right. And it wasn't until I got to the end of the block and was, you know, calm my son down and, and was able to, you know, to sort of calm down and, and not panic that I realized how mad I was at myself because I'd handled that situation terribly. You know, as a mom or as a parent, I, we're always looking for those moments in life th that are teaching moments, moments when we can impart some kind of wisdom to our kids through our actions, setting an example. Um, and here I'd had this incredible opportunity and I just panicked, I blew it because of course, afterwards I realized what I should have done. It seems so obvious to me now. So I should have, you know, I should have let my son cry. Kids cry all the time for the silliest things. I should have, instead of running away, I should have turned to the little girl and started up a conversation with her. I should have set an example for my son, shown him that there was nothing to be afraid of. I could have asked her how she liked her ice cream. I, you know, I, I could have introduced myself. There are so many other things I could have done rather than kind of hastily turn away and, and run away, basically. And I didn't run away, by the way, because of her. I ran away because I was trying to spare her feelings from my own son. And yet I realized afterwards that to her, and if she realized, or especially to the mom who I knew did realize, that's probably not the way it looked. And she might not have realized that my intentions were kind of good, even though the way I went about them were kind of not so great. Um, there was this wonderful uh, commencement address by George Saunders a couple of years ago, kind of went viral. And he talked about what he re regretted most in life were those failures of kindness. Uh, and I thought when I read that, that's exactly how I felt that day. I felt like I'd failed in kindness that day. And in any case, I really beat myself up about it. For the rest of the day, I obsessed about what I could have done differently, how I should have handled the situation. You know, do you guys ever like wish you had a do-over moment? Like you wish, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I could go back in time and just kind of undo what I just did. For me, that was my moment. I kept on reliving how I, what I could have said to the little girl, how, you know, I almost envisioned the mom and I becoming best friends. Um, we were going to go out for coffee. I mean, I had this whole other alternative scenario played out in my head, and it just didn't work out that way. Um, and that night, uh, again, I did obsess about it. I talked to my husband about it, my kids about it. We, we talked about it. It's a family. I happened to turn on the radio, and this amazing song called Wonder came on the radio by Natalie Merchant. It's a song that I have heard like hundreds of times, literally, because it was the cradle song that I used to sing to my older son when he was born. This came out in 1995. My older son was born in 96. And so it was on the radio all the time. I think I must have sung this song to my, to my son, you know, hundreds of times. Um, and yet... The words to the song had never really resonated with me the way they did that day because it's a, it's a song all about being different. It's a song about being so unique in the world that doctors come from everywhere to, just to see you and, and they stand over your head, you know, disbelieving what they're seeing. You know, it was a song about someone being born that is so different. But it's a song that's also so joyful and optimistic. And, and it gave me great hope for this girl. It gave me great hope for me. Um, and anyway, that night, I basically decided, you know what? This is my moment. I'm going to write a book. And it's going to be called Wonder. And it's going to be about a kid who, ha who's, who lives with, with what this little girl lives with, who has to face a world every day that doesn't know how to face him back. Uh, so I literally started writing that night, and in fact, these were my first, I, I started writing on post-it notes, which, you know, FYI is not a great way to write a book, um, but I did, and, um, and then soon I, I kind of, you know, gravitated to my computer, and, um, you know, it was great. It was very cathartic for me. It was, it was my way of sort of having my do-over moment. Um, I got to pour in all the things that I love the most in the world into wonder, you know, all, all, there's so many like references in that book, pop culture references, uh, movie references, you know, I'm a big Star Wars geek, uh, you know, so I got to put in all those references, um, my favorite songs I got to put in there. It was really great. It was a, it was a fun experience for me. 
Um, the only time, though, that I discovered that I could find the time to write, because, you know, I still had my full-time job, and I was still raising two kids, and, you know, is I would, um, I got into this routine where I would wake up at around midnight, and I would write till about three in the morning. And I did that every night for about a year and a half until I finished the first draft of the book. Um, but I got to put in a whole bunch of stuff, like precepts. People ask me, where do the precepts come from? Well, when I was in high school, I actually had a scrapbook full of, like, quotes or sayings that meant something to me. And, and so I, the precepts were, I thought, a great addition for me to put in the book. Um, people ask me about Mr. Brown, the teacher, the beloved English teacher. Well, here's the real Mr. Brown. He was my high school English teacher. And I like to put his picture in there. Um, for every teacher in the audience, if you're ever tired at the end of a long day and wondering, what the heck am I doing? Um, just remember, and I know you know this, but the impact that you guys have on your children goes far beyond anything that you could even imagine. Because I, I don't know if Mr. Brown realizes what an imp impetus he was with me. In fact, not too long ago, I found this note. I was looking through my old stuff, and it says, Raquel, write that book, then rewrite it if you must. When it's finally published, send me a copy or I'll haunt you. Um, and uh, yeah, I still haven't found him, so I, I should at some point. Um, but anyway, even then, in high school, I was talking about writing, obviously. Uh, I got to put in other stuff. Just at that moment in the book when the Pullman family happens to, a, you know, they, they get a dog named Bear, a little puppy. That coincided with when my family uh, adopted our little bear, uh, and that's the real bear. Um, that's bear now. See, <laughs> his his ears unfurled, and, and uh, they became like little flags on top of his head. Um, the character of Grands is based on my mom, uh, Nellie, um, and this actually does now explain the mystery of my name. People ask, "There's my mom." Her name was Nelly Palacio. So, and she, and she, unfortunately, she passed away about 11 years ago. So she never, and she was the one who was always telling me my entire life, you know you're a writer, you will write someday. Uh, so when it came time to choosing a, a, a name for my, my novel, my first novel, I thought making my name R.J. Palacio, Raquel Jaramillo Palacio, adding her name to my name was a great way of honoring her. Um, so, so that's where R.J. Palacio comes from. It's my mother's maiden name. Um, yep, there we go. So that's how I came to write Wonder, and it was an amazing experience, and that's kind of where I thought it would end. In fact, this is the poster that appeared at my community bookstore uh, a couple of weeks after the book was published. And in all honesty, I really thought that that's where it would end. I thought I might have one reading at my local bookstore to which a few of my friends came and, and family. And uh, there's, there are my kids now. Um, so I figured, you know, my kids would come. Um, and, and we had a little book party. There were maybe 30 people in the, the bookstore, and, and I figured if I could sell copies to 30 people there, then at least I sold 30 copies of the book. It never occurred to me that it would sell beyond that. Um, though this was my first indication. This was a note my son left for me, my younger son left for me one day after he'd read Wonder, and I thought, oh, that's cute. That's so sweet, you know, and this was the, this was the same boy that was the three-year-old when, you know, um, when I started writing Wonder and who had been afraid of the little girl. So, uh, so that was kind of cool. But then this, this wonderful thing started happening. You know, the message of the book, obviously, if you've read it, is, is not, I mean, yes, it's about a little boy with a facial difference, but what it really is is the book about kindness. It's a book about the impact of kindness on people, on our lives, um, and, and how kindness can really not only make someone's day, but it can literally change someone's life. And that message started catching on um, with teachers, especially with librarians. They were the first readers. And, you know, if you ever want to know, I mean, there's nothing more passionate in the world than a teacher or a librarian who wants to get a book into the hands of their students. Um, so they started evangelizing wonder. And pretty soon, Wonder started catching on, and uh, my publisher had created a website uh, where people could go on, kids could go on and pledge to choose kind, and lo and behold, kids started pledging to choose kind, and, and this started growing. There was a billboard in Times Square, which was really kind of awesome. 
Um, and uh, they started, you know, again, I didn't print these up. I mean, people, teachers started kind of doing their own thing and making buttons. And, and I started getting asked to go to schools like this one all across the country. And, and there were murals and, and people were doing bulletin boards. And I don't know, it just kind of started growing into this movement, um, much larger than anything I could have expected. Uh, kids all over the country were reading Wonder. Um, it became not just a school-wide read, but uh, a community-wide read, uh, and in fact, a city-wide read. I went to Fairfield and Santa Monica. Memphis, Tennessee chose it as a city-wide read. Uh, Vermont, the state of Vermont last year chose Wonder as like a statewide read. Uh, so it, it's, you know, it was mushrooming into something far beyond anything I could have imagined. Um, there were staged readings happening of Wonder. Um, in fact, one, one performance group did a 24-hour marathon reading. Um, so it, it was really pretty amazing. I've done a lot of traveling in the last three years. Um, people would send me these really cute, like amazing, this was a Valentine's Day card someone did. Um, people started shooting videos, like teachers starring their their children um, or making book trailers that's been a really if you go on youtube and you plug in wonder you'll see all these student made um, book trailers uh, people started celebrating you know in, in the book october 10th is augie's birthday uh, so now in classrooms people are like teachers are actually celebrating augie's birthday october 10th and they're making cakes and they're making uh, party hats and they're celebrating it uh, as part of a kindness initiative in schools. Um, the precepts have really caught on in a big way, and, and people, you know, kids have been sending me their precepts from all over, um, making artwork that has to do with wonder. I mean, you can imagine, this is just well beyond anything that even I could imagine happening. Um, I went to one school, they did this incredible, um, like, uh, uh, project, a school-wide project where they, the kids were asked to create masks of who they thought they were, you know, behind the mask. Um, this I thought was amazing. There's a science curriculum that's been built around Wonder. Who knew? Um, somehow they managed to figure out a way to find some science in it. So there you go. So, you know, it's been, a, a, you know, the whole keep cal calm and don't be a Julian. You know, there's been a lot of... Um, a lot of internet and social media uh, buzz around this book. And then um, the book started selling overseas too. In, in England, it was actually published uh, twice. It was published as a children's book and as an adult book. The red, the red one is the adult copy. It's the exact same book. The only difference is it has a different cover and it's sold in a different part of the, the bookstore. So um, it's an adult book. Um, and then it's been sold uh, in, to over 44 uh, countries um, worldwide. It's in 44 languages. This is just a handful. Um, it's really interesting to me as a book jacket designer who chose to use the same book cover and who didn't. You know, it's kind of it's kind of a funny experiment. Um, anyway, the, the 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 biggest impact though that I've had. I mean, the, the biggest life changing thing for me has been all the incredible emails I've gotten over the years from kids, just like you guys in the audience, who send me emails telling me that after they read Wonder, they wanted to be nicer people, which, which is amazing to me. Um, you know, they, they've learned that they don't want to judge people based on what other people look like, and, and uh, I get stories about how, um, you know, emails from people saying, you know, there was this girl in my class, and, and she had this difference, not maybe not a facial difference, maybe she was she had something that made her a little bit unique and I used to avoid her but now I've you know I go out of my way to to include her in things and and things like that so I keep getting these stories this email is one of my favorite this is from a woman who is 91 years old and she sent me this email and I'm, you don't have to read the whole thing but basically what had happened was she's had a wonderful life but reading wonder reminded her of something that had happened to her many years ago when she was 13 years old her father had just died her mom was sick, and she, at the age of 13, was sent to live with a good friend of theirs, uh, of her family's. And the girl that she, you know, was staying with was always very kind to her, very nice. Um, but the kids at the school, the new school she was going to, weren't always so nice. And apparently, one day, the girl, who was like her host friend, uh, was out sick. 
So she was in the school by herself, and she went to sit at the table she usually sat with, you know, with the girl. She took her tray, she sat down. The other girls at the table kind of got up, giggling, and left. And she was really, she felt really humiliated and, and hurt. And, and what's amazing is that 80 years later, she still remembers that pain. And so I like to show this email because I think it's a great reminder to everyone that your actions are noted. Your actions are remembered. I mean, years from now, 80 years from now, do you want to be remembered for being one of those mean girls at a lunchroom table? Or do you want to be remembered for having been just the opposite, maybe having been a summer to someone like Augie, uh, somebody who went out of their way to sit down with a new kid, or, or you went out of your way to congratulate the losing team, or whatever it takes, you know? Just, just you go out of your way to, to do something kind for someone else. People remember your actions. And I think sometimes kids forget that, especially at this age when we're trying to fit in and there's peer pressure and there's all this stuff going on. I, th I think it's good to remember sometimes that, hey, what I'm doing now, what I'm saying now, this, this joke I'm laughing at at someone else's expense, someone else might be watching and someone else might know, know that I'm doing this. So I'm not going to do that. So anyway, by far though, uh, the best thing that happened was that I started hearing from people who in real life look like Augie. And there are lots of kids who have craniofacial differences. There are organizations devoted to helping these kids. And for instance, I heard from one mom who talked about how um, her son had read Wonder and she noticed this big change in him because before, uh, just like Augie, he used to love wearing masks and stuff, but this was this Halloween he decided for the first time that he wasn't going to wear a mask. And she said this was, she was nervous though as a mom, she was really afraid for him, but on the other hand she noticed that this was like a chance for him to really grow and shine. And they send me pictures of their kids who are, I mean this, this mom sent me a picture of her son at camp, um, and she said it reminded her of, of Augie with, with Summer and Jack, and it reminds me too of Summer and Jack. And I get, kid, this is a kid from Brazil um, whose, you know, mom sent me. I've been meeting the most extraordinary kids um, with different differences, not just craniofacial differences, but, but other things that set them apart in ways that are very obvious. Um, so, so it's been extraordinary. This, though, out of all of the things that have happened, this is one of my favorite. This happened early on. Um, there was a kid named Peter who is in the children's, he's a, a, a member of the Children's Craniofacial Association. His mom uh, heads that organization, and Peter was born with a craniofacial difference. Uh, I think he's missing an ear, and, and he has other issues. Um, and he loves Wonder, and he wrote, he blogged about it. He wrote in his blog that, uh, that he, all the ways that he's like Augie. Like, like Augie, he said, you know, he loves Star Wars. Like Augie, he has to wear um, a hearing aid. Um, like Augie, kids stare at him a lot. Um, like Augie, he has an October birthday. You know, he mentioned all the ways he was like Augie, but then he also pointed out the ways he's different from Augie. And one of the ways he's different from Augie is that he himself had never received a standing ovation. Well, apparently there was a group of fifth graders somewhere across the country who happened, to, I guess they were reading Wonder and they were doing some research in their classrooms and they came upon this blog. And in this, well, here, they sent him a video message and they wrote, hi Peter, our class has heard about how much you love Wonder. We love it too. We wanted to do something special for you and send some kindness your way. So, now, unfortunately, I don't have the video of this. I just have the stills. But basically, they filmed themselves getting up and giving him a standing ovation. And I have to tell you, that just I, when I saw this, I started weeping. Um, I was in my office. I brought all my friends over. We were watching this. We were just, this to me epitomized um, sort of the sense of something growing beyond anything that you could possibly have even imagined in a book. I could never have imagined anything like this happening. So now you've had a standing ovation too. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Love, Mrs. Posey's fifth grade students. Um, so that, that made an impact, uh, not just on me, not just on all the people that read that, and saw the video and stuff, but on Peter, this little boy 
who took that as a sign that, you know what, I'm a wonder. And, you know, it, it's just been amazing. So, um, so that's the story of wonder. And um, a year after I wrote wonder, I came out with a book of precepts, Mr. Brown's book of precepts, uh, which, which are out now. And that's being converted into an app, which will now be uh, distributed soon. And then, of course, I wrote um, three, they're not sequels. They're kind of, um, they're just extensions of wonder. Uh, you know that one of the people that uh, we didn't hear from in Wonder was Julian, the bully. Now, the reason I didn't include Julian in Wonder is because Wonder was all about Augie. Uh, Wonder was, from the beginning to the end, Augie's story. And the problem with Julian was that, of course, he never bothered to get to know Augie, so he really had nothing to contribute to our, Augie's narrative. That's not to say that he didn't have an interesting story to tell on his own, though. So, um, so I, I decided to do the Julian chapter and kind of explore what made him tick. Why was he so? Why was he such a jerk? Basically, um, Pluto is told from Christopher's point of view. Now, Christopher doesn't even appear in Wonder other than as a name. Um, he was Augie's best friend before Wonder even starts. He was Augie's best friend from when they were babies together. So his perspective is very unique in that he can talk about Augie before fifth grade, surgeries that Augie's had, um, issues that Augie had, um, and what their friendship is like today. And of course, um, Shingling just came out last month and as an ebook and that is a story um, from Charlotte's point of view. Now Charlotte is a character, is a minor character in, in, uh, in Wonder. She is one of the three welcome buddies that Mr. Tushman uh, chooses to befriend Augie. And you know throughout the entire book she's always nice to him. You know she's like, hey Augie, you know, how you doing? But she never really goes out of her way to be anything more than just nice. She never really goes out of her way to be friends with Augie. So this is her story, and um, and so the, and 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 Summer uh, is in it a lot as well. So um, those three books are being bound up as one hardcover that's coming out uh, at the end of summer. Um, and so basically, this is it. This is my life now. Um, I finally finally quit my day job just two months ago. So. <laughs> Uh, yes, <laughs> and, and, uh, and anyway, that's it, that's, that's my story, that's um, where we are now, and, um, and I will open the floor to any questions, and I thank you so much for having me and letting me share my story with you guys, I really appreciate it, thank you very much, so. Hi. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Raquel. That was uh, terrific. We do have a, a microphone in this um, aisle here, uh, and maybe if we can bring up the lights, it'll be easier to see that microphone. Um, so while we're just situating, I'll just mention that uh, after I read Wonder, a couple of people um, said to me, you have to read the Julian chapter. You have to read the Julian chapter. It makes Wonder even better. It makes the ending better. And I said, no, nah, it's not possible. I'm not, I'm not bothering reading it. And then I did, and sure enough, and that's one of the people who told me to, to read it standing at the microphone. <laughs> Uh, and I feel like tonight, almost, it's, uh, it's even another, it takes it even to, to another level. I thought the, the story was, the many stories were touching and um, just so beautiful how uh, the book came to, to be born. So, so thank you so much for sharing with us. And uh, again, I hope we have some students come up to the microphone to ask some questions, and we'll go from there. We'll start with our president of the Board of Education. Thank you, Dr. Lasusa. Thank you, Rakay, for coming. I actually have to thank you for two things. One, for coming tonight. That's fantastic. And the other is, I was actually introduced and invited to read this book by my 15-year-old son. As you know, as a mother of sons, we don't get a lot of invitations, so I jumped at the chance to, uh, to read the book with him. Right. And then I did have a little inside info that you were coming early on, so I started buying a bunch of copies and handing them to my friends and not really telling them that you were coming later in the year. So thank you for coming. Thank but you. my question is actually... Um, when you wrote Wonder, when you started your post-it notes, is your process that you would envision the whole thing unfold it, and did you see it chronologically, or did you always envision it from a character's perspective? Because for me, it was amazing how the same incident was viewed by each of the characters in a completely different manner. So I was just wondering how that unfolded in, in your mind during the process. 
Um, when I started writing, it really was that night, and I really didn't know where it would go. I knew I wanted it to be a book. I knew I wanted it to be in the first person. I wanted it to be from Augie's point of view. <clears throat> and I knew I wanted it to be in the fifth grade because my older son had just finished. He, he was in the sixth grade. Um, and so fifth grade was very fresh in my mind. And um, I had a lot of opinions about how that year had gone for him because uh, like Augie, you know, uh, at least where we are, I don't know if that's the same. In, in this middle school, how old, when do you guys start? Fifth or sixth grade? Sixth. Sixth. See, I think that's better. And where, where my son goes to school, they start middle grade and the fifth grade. And um, so it was a year of, of transitioning, a year of uh, watching my son, you know, the heartbreak of friendships that are torn asunder or friends who are no longer friends and and all of that stuff one of the things I kept on on thinking as I was watching my son go through fifth grade my son who obviously doesn't look like Augie and who's the sweetest kid you could possibly imagine um, was a that being sweet in middle school doesn't seem to be any sort of guarantee or of um, popularity uh, and in fact almost quite the reverse and and two was that um, I, I, where were the parents? I, I, I couldn't get over it. These were friends of mine who sort of, I don't know what happened, but like in the sixth grade, fifth grade, uh, the, sometimes they'd know their kids were kind of like, you know, becoming kind of not so nice, and they just still had a very hands-off attitude. And I kept on saying, well, wait a minute, you guys, you still have an impact, you know? The, wake up, your kid's kind of going this way, and steer them back, you know? And, and so I had a lot to say about the fifth grade. So I knew that Starting at Wonder, um, I was going to use it as my little platform um, to also kind of be a little wake-up call to parents to kind of, hey, remind your kids of the importance of those, those very essential virtues, kindness, respect, um, paying it forward, uh, all these other things that, that I just wanted people to sort of focus on a little bit more. When I started writing it, that's all I knew, and basically after that, the characters just kind of took over. They're the ones that propel the narrative. They got me going. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Julia. Uh, I'm one of the two uh, presidents and founders of the book club at the high school, and we read your book in November. Uh, part of our... Um, uh, we had like a kindness week and it was part of um, like we read your book and it was it's a very good meeting We had we had a couple of other Book club members here and I was wondering if you um, ever thought of writing a sequel of Augie as a teenager Because like it'd be interesting to see what he goes through as a teenager with like relationships in high school and navigating like life as a teenager into college mm -hmm. Well, you know, I've I've kind of gone on record saying that I'm not going to be writing a sequel to wonder um and here's why. I think the reason I chose to end Wonder Where I Did, which was on a very happy day in Augie's life, is because I, at that point I think I'd said everything I wanted to say about him. I think we can conclude from that, any clever reader, that just because the book ends on a happy note, it doesn't guarantee Augie a happy life. What it does say, though, is that he has what he needs inside of him to get through all the challenges that life will throw at him, just like it throws at all of us. Um, he's going to have his ups. He's going to have his downs. And, um, but he, I think we learn in wonder that he has what it takes inside of him to get through it. And I think that's the important part. So I think if I were to write about Augie as a teenager or in college, I don't know, I kind of prefer to let the readers imagine what his life will be like. Um, I have had a lot of kids come up to me uh, and ask me what I think Augie will be when he grows up. And uh, I'll uh, let, uh, well, I'll tell you guys, the, the two major professions, and I think it's really interesting, because I always figured he'd grow up to be an astronaut. That, that's what I figured. Um, but overwhelmingly, students think that he's gonna grow up to be a teacher which I think is really kind of awesome and says a lot about how, about teachers and, and how students view the teachers. So anyway, I, I think that's kind of neat. But to answer your question, I don't think I'm going to write a, a sequel. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Emily, and I was wondering if you designed the covers for your books. 
You know, um, you would think I would have, right? <laughs> I, I chose not to very early on in the process because um, for one, I wanted my experience being an author, uh, being purely an author, you know, and I, you know, being an art director, I will tell you one thing, it's a great job, but you have to develop a really, really thick skin because everybody has an opinion about a book cover. I mean that you know they might not have read the book they can't tell you if it's good or bad but they'll tell you if it's a good book cover or not in their opinion and the thing is no two people can agree on what makes a good book cover so you're always disappointing someone um, so I didn't want it ever to be where people might come up to me having read wonder and say something like you know I really liked your book but I hated that cover uh, so I, I just wanted my experience to be purely about being an author so um, having said that I did work very closely with the art department um, at my book publisher, and um, they used the illustrator that I wanted. They came up with the idea, though, the face and the tight, I, I, which I loved. Um, I mean, we did have sort of an unwritten agreement that if I, if they came up with a cover that I hated, then I would end up doing it. But as it turned out, I think they came up with the best cover in the whole world. I love their cover. Um, so yeah, I didn't. Hi. Oh, Hi. Shoot. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Una, and um, you told us that you based Augie and Mr. Brown off of people you know, and I was wondering if you based other people like Charlotte and Jack after other people you know? It's a great question. I did. You know, I, all of the characters in Wonder are kind of composites or like mashup, mashups of kids I either knew or I, I knew when they were little or or who are friends of my kids or something like Augie himself is kind of a mashup between my older son uh, and his friend at the time whose name was Ben. Ben used to have like long hair and he used to kind of mumble a lot. He would talk under his hair. And so whenever I would think of Augie, I would think of Ben talking, you know, so that, that was, you know, um, Charlotte was definitely a composite of some girls that I knew. Uh, and, and so was, in fact, Jack will, was a composite of two brothers I knew um, who used to come over to my older son's house for play dates and stuff. And, and their mom, who I love very much, um, would come by to pick them up and say, hey, Jack, Will, because that one was Jack, the other was Will. Come on, let's go. And that name kind of stuck. Um, the only character, there are two characters that are, it's funny, Via came very naturally to me. And it wasn't until after the book was published and an old friend of mine who's known me for a long time read the book. And she said, you know, you're Via, right? And I'm like, no. And she said, oh my God, you were so Via when you were 15 years old. And then looking back, I realized, oh yeah, that's why she was so easy to me. She, there were lots of, her personality and mine, we, we aligned. Um, and then Summer, there was a little girl I knew in my neighborhood whose name was Summer who was the sweetest girl I'd ever known. She was absolutely the kindest, sweetest, cutest, most adorable thing. And I used to say to her mom, she's so amazing. And the mom would say, I know. I mean, because you know, you can't, you almost can't take responsibility for that sometimes as a parent. You just, you know, and she was really special. So, um, so basically, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my Hi. name is Ryan. And I have two questions. One is, will you be making a movie out of Wonder? Well, uh, you know, it's not even like I would be making a movie, but I sold the rights to the book to people who say they're going to make the movie. Um, and those people are great. I really like them. Um, they are the producers uh, who of Lionsgate. They did The Hunger Games and Twilight and stuff, so they have a good track record. Um, and you know, but there are also challenges to making this movie because um, I know, you know, Wonder came out around the same time as The Fault in Our Stars, and I see that that movie kind of came and went, and um, and Wonder we still haven't even gotten into production. And and I understand that one of the big challenges, as you can imagine, is how do they portray Augie? And uh, that's, that's sort of right now, they, they have uh, sent out a nationwide talent search. Um, they are interviewing kids, some with craniofacial differences, some without. And I, in fact, I'm gonna ask this audience what you guys think. Now it seems that there are two options. They could either hire 
a 10-year-old or 11-year-old actor and put a whole bunch of like makeup on him or CGI stuff, you know, uh, and he could play Augie. So that's option number one. And option number two is to find a kid who really, from the craniofacial community, and, and hope that he can act. Um, so how many people think we should go with option one? And how many people think we should go with option two? Right, I know, me too. And I, I think the producers uh, would like that as well. So I, I think we're just, I think they're just kind of waiting for the right script and the right everything to come together. Um, so I have to trust that they will do it right. And also my second question is, um, on the cover, my library teacher pointed this out to me. If Augie doesn't have any ears, why does he have ears on the cover? Yeah, you know, people have pointed that out to me. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the, that's how the artist represented him. And again, I was trying to be a really good author and not make waves. So I didn't, I thought, and again, I didn't think anyone would read the book. So it didn't really matter. <laughs> um, seriously, that's, I, yeah. But no, you're right, you're right. He's got ears on the cover, and in real life, his ears are like little cauliflower ears. But it looks good. So <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Josie. And I was wondering, I know that you're writing the books of the Julian chapter and Pluto and Shingling, but I was wondering if you were going to write one about Summer's perspective, because she was a big part in one. Yeah, she is. She is in Shingling a lot. She's like, it turns out she and Charlotte, you know, have this friendship that Augie didn't even know about in Wonder. So um, that's explored a lot in Shingling. But no, I think I think with these three ebooks, I'm kind of, I mean, I say that hesitatingly because things change, but right now I think I'm going, I'm, I'm turning to something new to write about. Um, I'm going to let wonder be its own world for a little while, and then maybe I'll come back to something at some point, but I, I think that's it for the moment. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Tyler, and would you, if you were to make the storyline of the movie, would you change it? Would I change a storyline in the movie? Wow, I wish the producers would ask me something like that. <laughs> I wish the producers would ask me if I would write it. Um, I would change it a little bit because I think, you know, in, in some ways, Wonder is a very internal story. I mean, in some ways, in every way. It's, it's the internal voices of these characters. Um, much of the action that takes place is not exactly grand or cinematic, you know? And, and so I think for a movie to be interesting, um, we would have to figure out a way to make it visually uh, as interesting as the book is in narration. And I think to do that, there would have to be more plot. Um, so yeah, I would, I would probably change a few things if they were asking me to write the movie, which they are not. So I don't know what they're going to do. I really don't. Hi, my name's Dennis, and my question is, how often would it be when you write the story and then go back and rewrite it to fit an event? Yeah, well, it took me about a year and a half just to write that first draft. And I tried to be very disciplined with myself and not go back and rewrite along the way, because I knew if I started doing that, I would never finish the book. Because there is a tendency to want to go back and write that first paragraph over and over again until it's perfect. And then you just never finish. So uh, it took me about a year and a half to finish. And then I did go back and edit and rewrite. And by then, um, I had found an agent I really liked. And she gave me some suggestions. And then, of course, you, the way it works is then you submit the manuscript to different publishers to see if anyone wants to publish the book. And um, interestingly enough, they, they, we, we submitted it to seven different publishers. Four of them rejected the book. Three of them said they wanted to publish the book. Two of those three said they wanted to publish the book, but they wanted to change a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, they wanted to get rid of, for instance, both of them, uh, the entire high school part. They wanted to get rid of Miranda and Justin. They wanted it to be just uh, middle grade. And the publisher I ended up going with said, no, 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 I love Justin, I love Miranda, I want to keep the high school part, and um, let's keep it just like it is with a few edits. And then I worked with her for about a year, back and forth with some changes, and, and, um, and it was a great collaboration. It takes a while to publish a book. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hi, my name is Adi. Uh, I would like to know, like, in the book Wonder, so Jack and his little brother, they get scared of Augie. And, like, did you base that off of when your son and your older son got scared yeah, of that little that girl? Yeah, that scene in the book in front of the ice cream store was in the book when, when Jack is with his babysitter, that was me, uh, and his baby brother in front of the ice cream store. That was based exactly, you know, well, not exactly. In fact, I didn't even write it the way it really happened because I thought it seemed unbelievable. You know, it was almost the, the chocolate milkshakes going. I thought, oh, no one's going to believe that. But that is what happened. But I didn't put it in the book because that would have been too much. But yeah, that, that's what influenced that scene. Hi, my name is Greg, <laughs> and my question is, did you just base Augie off of one person, or did was it a collaboration of, of many people to base his functions, his personality? Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was kind of, you know, really was kind of, I, when I would write him, it, I had a lot of my, I kept on, I would think of my son and his friend Ben. They, they were just, it was like a mashup, you know, my kind of, you know, it was easy as a, as a mom in a lot of ways to um, to write from the point of view of a fifth grade boy because I eavesdrop a lot. And, uh, you know, I'd come home and find, you know, five or six 11-year-old uh, boys playing Halo in my living room. And, um, and you know, boys are loud, so you could hear them all the way across the room and, and or the house. And so, so it was easy for me to kind of get, kind of just cull from the way they talked and, and the way they interacted, um, that boy speak. Uh, so it was kind of, Augie really was a composite of kind of my son and his friend, but just like a lot of, a lot of, a, I would pick up pieces here and there. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Sophie. Did you ever at first, when you started Wonder, did you ever consider finding a true story to use? Did I ever consider, I'm sorry, what? Sorry? Finding a true story to use? Finding a true story? Yeah, using a true story to read the book. Like basing, you, basing use, it on a true story. Basing it on a true story? Yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't know anyone who had a facial uh, difference at the time. So, and in fact, I did a lot of research on facial differences, but I purposely chose not to interview any families. Uh, once I started writing the book, because I, I really didn't want it to be about any specific person. I was afraid that if I if I started interviewing people, it would become their story. And I really wanted to make this about this fictional character named Augie Pullman and the things he goes through. Uh, I didn't want it to be necessarily representational of the way every kid with a craniofacial difference is. Um, because obviously every kid is unique, and this was simply going to be Augie's story. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'm Samantha, and um, my question is, was it hard to, like, after you had written the post-its, was it hard to actually sit down and say, okay, I'm actually going to start writing this. I'm going to work on, like, the draft. It really, oddly enough, it wasn't. I got so into the book so quickly that getting up at midnight every night might seem like a challenge. It really, I, there was a point where I was so into it that I, I felt this responsibility to finish it because I thought, well, if, you know, if I don't finish this book, no one will ever get to know these characters who seemed very real to me. So I would wake up at night and it would be like I was entering that world. And at that point, it was a very small world. It was only my world, you know? And, and so finishing it became kind of, um, it was strange. It was like, it was a, I just felt the need to really get them out in the world. Um, and so it, it wasn't that hard for me. It was the first time, because you know, over the years, I would try to write. I would try, you know, I had, I have like a cabinet full of first drafts and outlines and ideas and stuff, but I never really followed up on anything. But Wonder was the first time that I actually started it and just, I didn't, I refused to stop until I finished. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Justin, and I was wondering if uh, you were gonna, uh, if you're like thinking about, or if you're gonna write any chapters about like the adults or Mr. Pullman or uh, the principal, Mr. Cheshman. I'm so sorry, I totally did not get that. 
Sorry. <laughs> uh, are you going to like write any uh, chapters about the big adults like Mr. Pullman and Mr. Tushman? Oh, so like the grown-ups. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I very specifically decided not to write any uh, points of view from adult points of view, basically, no, any chapters from the adults' perspectives, because I wanted to keep this squarely in the children's book world. And I knew that if I opened it up to the experiences of the adults, the book would take a different turn. It would become somewhat darker. And uh, because, you know, the parents, the way they're represented in the book, they're slightly idealized. And that's because they're only seen from the point of view of Augie and sometimes Via, who's a little less, who's a little more critical of them. But still, they're only seen through their perspectives. And, you know, kids. They usually have this sort of idyllic perspective of, of their parents for at least a couple more years, right? <laughs> Until they're teenagers or late teenagers. But um, so, so in a sense, I, I wanted to keep that uh, representation of them through their eyes. But we can surmise that even though Isabel, Augie's mom, is you know really trying to be positive in front of Augie, she only wanted to show him. Uh, positive energy and love and obviously she's protective of him but she's you know she also you know she wants to do what she can to help him in in life and in everything possible um, but she's not going to show her darker moments to him you know she's she's going to keep that for herself or or for when she's out with her best friends um, you know she, th then maybe she'll have a you know, maybe she won't be quite as positive as she seems to Augie she might go she might get a little frustrated she might get a little angry sometimes and um, but she's not going to show that to her kids I think so that's why I chose not to include them and um, I uh, did, did, did you really have anybody that you based Justin off of? Justin is, um, <laughs> he's kind of, my, my younger son had started taking violin lessons the year that I was writing Wonder. And his violin teacher, who's in his 40s, um, it was, he, he was just a great guy. And I, I kind of based Justin on what I figured this guy would have been like when he was 15 years old. So that, that's... <laughs> He has glasses and he has long hair, and he's just kind of Justin-like, you know. He tucks his hair behind his ears, um, so that that's who I based him on. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Allison, and I was wondering if you ever met the girl at the ice cream place again. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that one either. So sorry. Um, did you ever meet the girl from the ice cream place again? Oh. No, I have not. And I, you know, there are times, I still, I look, I still get emails and everyone, you know, I keep on thinking one day I'm going to get an email from her saying, you know, hey, that was me in front of the ice cream store. Um, but then I, I also realized that um, even though that day was very important to me, you know, it, it really was only like seven seconds, six seconds from beginning to end. And I play it up in my mind. Um, but my older son, who remembers that day, he's often telling me, he's like, Mom, it wasn't that big a deal. You know, it's like, <laughs> it was like, you know, it happened really fast. I don't think they even noticed. I think the mom might have noticed. I don't think the girl even knew what was going on. Again, it happened very quickly. And unfortunately, or I, it probably happened so many times, something similar to that, that it might not have meant anything at all to these people. Um, it might not have registered. They might... I don't know. I don't think they even really were aware of it. Thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm Carol. Are you going to write, like, a big sequel to Wonder instead of, like, just the one chapters? Sorry, I missed oh, that, too. I guess I need uh, to plug my ears. <laughs> Are you going to write, like, a whole book sequel to Wonder? No. I think okay. I'm not. I think I'm going to leave that um, to everybody's imaginations. All right. Thank you. Does your younger son remember when he met that little girl? And he doesn't. And then when he read Wonder, and even now he's he's a little shy. Of, you know, he's in the fifth grade now. He's a little shy about all this stuff. Um, he's a, like I couldn't go talk at his school at all. <laughs> and um, I think I, you know, I think I mean he's heard the story. I think sometimes he feels a little badly. In fact, one time he did say he felt badly that 
he had responded that way. And I said, sweetie, it wasn't, you know, you were only three years old. I tell the story not to point out the way you acted, but to talk about the way I acted. Because um, you were just a baby. I mean, you were just reacting in a way that's completely understandable. So, um, yeah, they're good, though. Thank you. Oops. Look at you. I think it, it's starting to get a, a little bit late. I don't want to disappoint any of the, the kids who've been standing in line, but we want to make sure we have some time for um, some book signings. And uh, we've been answering questions for about, or Raquel's been answering questions for about 25 minutes. So um, why don't we just let this uh, young lady uh, ask, ask the final question. And then if anyone wants to have a book signed or ask a quick question out in the lobby, we can um, do it that way, okay? So one more. Uh, <laughs> And we'll go from there. My name's Emma. When you wrote the book, did you me did you want Julian to be good or bad? Did you want us to forgive him or like Well, I didn't know how Julian was going to be when I started writing him. And then he became I mean, it's a funny thing when you're writing a book, the characters kind of take over and he started becoming the bad kid. Um, and that's just the way he turned out. And as a writer, you kind of have a backstory in your mind about what makes people tick. Uh, it's one way to sort of make your characters feel truthful, is you build a whole story. So in my mind, I knew that one of the reasons Julian was the way he was was that he was kind of afraid of Augie. You know, he just didn't know how to deal with it. And he didn't have any parents, he didn't, his parents weren't kind of getting that. They weren't giving him the help he needed to understand that some of his nastiness was born from fear. And um, it wasn't, so in the Julian chapter, we actually kind of see it from his point of view. We realize that, oh, he'd been really, he was getting nightmares from seeing Augie. Not that that justifies the way he was acting, but it kind of explains a little bit about why he and his mom were so... Uh, eager to have Augie kind of be out of their lives. He was a great inconvenience to him. But it wasn't until that summer that he spends with his grandmother in Paris who tells him a story that he starts to realize, he starts, it finally clicks on him that he was the bad guy. I don't think he realized that. Um, from his point of view, he never realized that he was the bad guy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.